Beautiful. Amen. Amen. Would you bow your heads with me? Father, again, we invite your spirit. But this time, we invite him for the purpose of speaking to our hearts, our minds, to manifest yourself in a way that we encounter Jesus here this morning and that we are changed by him. In his name we pray, amen. Amen. It's a big thing these days, if you haven't noticed, to announce a coming child. Just go on the internet, go onto YouTube, baby announcement, they're everywhere. Creativity off the charts, with fanfare, video, cakes, poppers, explosions, all these things put together for the purpose of announcing a baby who was on the way. Our scripture this morning from Luke chapter 2 is God's version of a birth announcement. Nowhere else in the Gospels does God directly announce to anyone that the Messiah has been born into the world except here. This is it, Luke 2. And the characters of the story, we have Mary, we have Joseph, we have angels, we even have some some animals in that barn that they're in. And shepherds? Shepherds. You see, I'm taken back by this a little bit. This is Jesus. This is Christ, which means Messiah the savior of the world through whom no one else, no one can be saved except through him. This son of God, who wasn't just lent to the world, he was given to the world. This is his announcement. And you would think, okay, He's coming to his people. It's going to go directly to the Jewish leaders, the priests, the rabbis, the scribes. But no. It was given to shepherds. These are the last people you might expect to hear in this story receiving the announcement of the birth of the Messiah. Or is it? You see, Moses and David, two extremely important figures in Jewish history, were both shepherds. And what we find is that God uses throughout the scriptures, throughout the many stories, God uses the meek and the humble things of life to accomplish great things for him. But in this New Testament period, in this story, the shepherds are background figures, mostly anonymous. We don't see many names, any names, really, of any of the shepherds. In society of that day, they were social outcasts. They had little contact with people. They were always living out in the hills. Notice in the text, it says, they lived out amongst the fields with their sheep. There were few occupations that were lower or lesser thought of than being a shepherd. You see, the picture of piety was all transferred to the priests, the Pharisees, especially the Sadducees who were leaders at that time. They were the examples. They were the picture of what God was like. But God didn't see it that way. God sent this announcement to shepherds. 
Now keep in mind that the wise men don't appear in our traditional story for about two years. They weren't there in the manger. They came and Joseph was not there and they were in a house and it was a child, not a baby. So many different things. We, we understand that part of the story. It's fun to, to include the wise men in the, in the announcement of the birth of Christ because it was kind of the second phase of that. But in the story of his birth, God said, I'm going to announce this to and through shepherds. You know, like these shepherds, it can sometimes feel like we are anonymous. Just blending into the background, not a major part of any story being written. And some of us may be even comfortable with that thought. I'm just not an upfront, out there person. Or it that way. But what I find is that God loves that attitude. He loves it when we feel inadequate, when we feel like we're behind the scenes people, when we feel like, ah, you know, I don't know if I can do much of a, a big thing for God. God loves that and he can use that. And he used it to announce the birth of his son. It says in Psalm 8, Verses 3 and 4, consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have ordained. What is man that you are mindful of him, and the son of man that you visit him? You see, Jesus is Emmanuel. He's God with us. Our creator not only visited this world, he gave himself to it. You know, it, I often, you know, when I read the text, John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son. I think we think of it in terms of he gave it for my salvation, for the salvation of the whole world. But it was more than that. It went further than that. When the Godhead got together and developed this plan to save mankind, they gave of themselves forever, permanently. This isn't just a visit. This is Jesus giving up his omnipresence, his ability to be everywhere at once to become a human being so that you might be able to reach up and clasp the hands of divine and to be saved. And then he sticks with us. He's not just coming into the world, God with us. He is with us today through his spirit. Each and every moment we rely on, abide, and we trust in him. That's what this story is about. Make no mistake. Don't think yourself unimportant or un inconsequential. The story reveals that God Especially notices people like you. And he wants to announce through you the coming of the Savior to someone's life. Notice that when the angel appears, they were all afraid. And immediately the angel said, Do not be afraid. Not only were the, dis the, the shepherds disturbed suddenly because of this appearance of this glorious being, but their lives were personally interrupted and permanently interrupted. And this can be a scary thing. I mean, think of it as from a shepherd's perspective. You're used to talking to sheep. Any of you guys talk to your animals? You have pets, you talk to them. Rochelle would love to see a video of me talking to the animals when she's away, when I'm by myself. Because, you know, we have good conversations. They're typically one-way conversations, although I get nonverbal language back. 
you can imagine, these shepherds, they're used to talking to their sheep. They're not interacting much with people, maybe amongst themselves from time to time. But all of a sudden, things are changing very rapidly for them, and they're hearing the greatest announcement this world has ever had, that the Messiah has come. So these words, do not be afraid, this isn't advice. Certainly, it alleviates some, some concern, some fear they had. But these, these words are meant to comfort, to bring strength and encouragement to the shepherds. And then, of course, when all the other angels appeared, it was almost confirmation right there that this is absolutely true. This is the biggest deal the world has ever known. The story tells us that the shepherds had to see the Christ child for themselves. You know, we all need to experience Jesus personally. We've got to meet him in the quiet the quietness of our mind and our heart. Because only when you come face to face with Jesus can the transformation begin. It says in Luke 2, verse 15, picking up this story, so it was when the angels had gone away from them into heaven that the shepherds said to one another, let us now go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has come to pass, which the Lord has made known to us. And they came with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the babe lying. Now when they had seen him, they made widely known the saying which was told them concerning this child. And all those who heard it marveled at those things which were told to them by the shepherds. But Mary kept all these things and pondered them in her heart. Then the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things that they had heard and seen as it was told to them. The shepherds were changed forever. It couldn't be the same. Not after meeting Jesus. These people, these shepherds who live quiet, nomadic lives, suddenly had lots to say. I'm sure that the towns around were a bit dumbfounded. I mean, here are these quiet shepherds that don't say a word, much of anything. They're out with their sheep, and they've got suddenly this, this, this message to share. And not only is it just, you know, some message that you know, it's, it, it's kind of a nice-to-know thing. This is the message that Israel has been waiting for. Messiah has come. I wish we could step into the two years between the shepherds and the wise men and see what was happening around Bethlehem, around Jerusalem, but we don't really hear of any of that story. We don't know much of what's happening. What we do know is that it's probably not much because the people are surprised yet again when the wise men show up asking where the Messiah is, the king. You see, I believe when we hear good news like this, something so unexpected something so impactful that we cannot keep it to ourselves. My perspective as a pastor is that I don't have to try to urge and convince you to share the gospel. I don't have to lay guilt trips on anybody. You know, you should be out there witnessing and testifying and sharing books. and all. I, I don't have to do that. What I need to do is make sure that you have an encounter with Jesus. 
Because when you have an encounter with Jesus and he comes in here and here, you can't be quiet. You can't be quiet because of what he's done for you personally. And this is the essence of the Christmas story. Yes, the Savior is coming to the world, but don't keep that Savior distant. Let him come into your life. Don't just recognize his mission. Let his mission bear its fruit in you. What if the shepherds heard the announcement but didn't go? What if they were too afraid or too busy with their lives, tending their sheep? They would have missed God's real gift to them personally. And I want to encourage you today to have an encounter with Jesus personally today. Let him know that you want him living inside you. You want the Savior of the world to bear fruit through your life and your testimony as to what he's done and to transform you, to change you forever. The Christmas season isn't just about telling this story over and over again. The Christmas season is about telling our story as it connects with him and his story and what he has done for us personally. I love services where people have a chance to just say a few words about what Christ has done for them. And we don't have a lot of time. We have five minutes or so. But I want to give you an opportunity. If you just feel like it's got to come out, the fire in your bones, you want to say what God has done for you, I want to give you a chance to just raise your hand. We'll get you a mic and just let everybody know what Jesus has done for you. Does anybody just... Okay, we have a hand back there. Adrian, I think it is. Can't see very well with the spots. Good, good morning, um, church family. My name is a Adrian Watson. And the Lord woke me up this morning and started me on my way. Yes. Amen. Amen. All right. Do we have anybody else that just wants to testify what God has done for them, what Jesus means to them? Okay, up here. And then anybody else? We've got a couple microphones. We can get a second microphone to somebody. Who wants to go next? Just raise your hand. Yes. Elizabeth. Good morning, church family. Um, God has given me peace. Peace. Amen. Peace that goes beyond comprehension, right? Amen. Well, for me, God was very patient. I was born and raised a Christian, Adventist, and out into the world, and he caught up to me. <laughs> Amen. And he gave me peace in my life mm. and changed me. Amen. Thank you. Amen. Praise the Lord. Amen. There's this hand up there, another one over here. Hi, I'm Belinda, and I want to share that one of my, God has done so many things in my life, but one of my favorite things is things that I loved before that had nothing to do with God, that are, were totally selfish, have gone away, and things, God has replaced my heart with heavenly desires, heavenly wants, and a love for my neighbor that I never had before, and I praise God for a changed heart. Amen. Amen. Yeah, Edna. Hi, my name is Edna Lucia. Hi. 
everybody. <laughs> I have, I want to thank you, God, what he gave it to me, that I don't work on Saturdays for more than 25 years. Mm. Gives you that rest. Amen. Anyone else? Just want to share a quick thought? We have a hand up here, John. Okay, go ahead, Pat. Yes, I just want to thank him for confidence and for hope. We have such a strong hope. Doesn't yes. matter what happens here. Yeah. He's still given us hope and his presence and his love. It's just marvelous. Amen. Thank you, Pat. Yes. Happy Sabbath, church. My name is Esther, and I was born in the Philippines, and I became Seventh-day Adventist when I had my I I got married to my husband, and I was reading um, the gifted hands of Dr. Ben Carson when when I was still in the Philippines, and then one day there were a missionary group. Adventist missionary group came to visit our village and then I tried to help them and then the after they came back to America they brought us here my whole family and then when I was reading the gifted hands too of Dr. Ben Carson when I was still in the Philippines and I said that I'm gonna be this I was pregnant that time and I said this this baby this son uh, this whoever you know I don't know the the what do you call this the gender of my child and I said he, he will become a doctor or she will become a doctor and then God was so good he brought us here in America and then my son now is a pediatrician and and he is and he is here today Amen. and he was also he become a child preacher and he was recognized by the general conference when we were in the philippines that time so Very nice. god brought us god answers here prayers he answered the prayer of his mother amen any last okay back there i'm harold and i'm really happy and blessed by the Lord for the support he had the entire year with my family, my two children, and my grand, four grandchildren. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Amen. God is good. Yes. God has, uh, I'm Leon. Uh, God has done amazing things in my life. I am a recovered alcoholic and drug addict. Been sober for a long time. Amen. And God showed me a lot of stuff in this last month. I've lost two best friends from drug and alcohol. And as I'm burying him, um, went to another friend's house and he was on his floor. There's beers all over the floor. And all I did was just think about what's, how bad his life is. And I just thought, I never, never prayed for him. And as I'm coming back from Albuquerque, I start praying. I'm like, Lord, please deliver him. And you won't believe this so amazing he calls me five minutes later after the prayer it's one in the morning he, and he says i'm going to rehab he's been in rehab for three weeks now amen and, uh, yeah oh that's awesome see one thing i've learned about the lord thank you so much for all your testimonies one thing i've learned that i it took me too long to find out was that it's not about me waiting for the opportunity or, or getting together the, the ability myself to overcome the challenges, the, the, the alcohol, the partying, the drug, all the stuff I used to do. Because, you know, we can put that off inevitably, uh, indefinitely, right? We can just keep saying, oh, you know, when, when this, when that. And so often I found many of my friends just not wanting to even consider Christ because of all the things that they would have to give up. But what they don't realize is that when Jesus comes into your life, your desires change. You're not giving stuff up anymore. Because he changes you and, and puts a love in you for him that you just 
don't care about that stuff anymore. It's all about him. And my friends, this, this season is a wonderful opportunity for us to share in ways when people are open to the story, to share your personal testimony of what Jesus has done in your life and how that child that was born 2,000 years ago is real because of what you've experienced personally. So I want to encourage you. Share the good news with somebody this season. Bless them. Let them know that Jesus has come, but more than that, he's come into your life. And he wants to come into the lives of everyone who will have him. It's a wonderful tradition here at Camelback to sing at the end of our homecoming service, uh, to sing the Messiah, a specific part of a, a number of the Messiah. And uh, what I want to do, we're going to have some books up here for those who want to come forward and stand as a choir up here with us. We want to invite you to come down to do that. Uh, John Sackinger is going to lead us, conduct us as a choir. Thank you, John, for agreeing to do that. And, and pick up a book, and we'll let you know the, the page to turn into, and sing with us up here. Uh, we're going to have Pat that is leading us on the organ. And if you want to stay seated, that's fine as well. If you need a book and you want to go that way, oh, there's words on the screen as well. But we'd love to have you come up here, because there's nothing like a whole church choir. So if you can come up, please come up. But if you, if you can't or don't want to, the words will be there. You can follow along as best you can. You know about this.
I just want to have a, a, a closing benediction for us. So if we could just pause everybody for just one minute. Father in heaven, we are so thankful for Jesus because he will reign forever and ever, not only in our hearts and our minds starting now, but throughout eternity. So we lift him up today to glorify him and all that you have done through him. And in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, our Savior, all God's people says, amen. amen. God bless you. Have a wonderful Christmas tomorrow.